Today, we return to the book of Colossians, our second week. We only have three weeks. It's such a little book. <laughs> but yes, we are returning to the book of Colossians today. And um, I'm going to spend a little time reminding us of the context of Colossians. And then we're going to revisit that phrase from last week that we were kind of, at least I was kind of stuck on, the describing Christ as the firstborn from among the dead. I want to come back to that. And then um, we're going to read, read Colossians 1, 24 through 2, 23. So um, let's start with a brief look at context. And ladies, if you want the fuller version, you can go ahead and listen to last week because we talk about it more in depth. Um, but first, ladies, and you know I love it when you just yell out answers. So that's my favorite kind of Bible study. So feel free to just call it out or mumble it, whatever you want. But so first, ladies, who is the author of Colossians? Who's the author? It's Paul, but and who? Paul and... Timothy, exactly. Paul and Timothy. Uh, we have we know this based on um, external and internal evidence. So the internal evidence, Paul says he's the author. Um, the theology of Colossians is also consistent with his other letters. So that's internal evidence. External, all the early church fathers all claim that Paul wrote Colossians. So that's our external evidence. Now, who is our audience, ladies? It's the church in Colossae, exactly. So unlike Ephesians that we believe was intended for all the churches in around the area of Ephesus, uh, in Colossians, Paul does address specific issues going on in this church. So it's very specifically for a certain church. Uh, and I've told you, ladies, but you have to remember that it's like we're listening to one side of a phone conversation, right? Like we only get all the answers that Paul is giving. We don't get the questions that were initially sent to him. So we kind of need to read the, between the lines to figure out what problems is Paul addressing. Um, so that's the who. So where and when was Colossians written? Do you ladies remember where was Colossians written? What city? Rome, exactly. And the when, we believe it's about 61 to 62 AD. So Paul is in house arrest in prison in Rome, and he is writing to some of the churches in and around um the Roman Empire. So, and actually this answers the next question. What is Colossians? What form of literary style? It's a letter. Exactly. Perfect. So it's not a full statement of all Christian thought and teachings. It's a letter to a specific church. And then why? Why does Paul write the letter to the church in Ephesus? So this is really the question that we are going to be looking at through all three weeks that we spend on this book. Um, we learned from Colossians, from the book itself, that as we talked about last week, a man named Epaphras initially brought the gospel to Colossae and planted the church that is there. From the end of Colossians, we learned that that Epaphras, this same guy, is now with Paul in Rome. So it seems that Epaphras has come to Rome to ask Paul how to deal with some problems going on with this church in Colossae. And um, Paul writes Colossians as an authoritative word from God to combat the false teachings in the church. Now, um, I'm currently listening to Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh and Sean McDowell which I'm really excited about. Um, I am personally wanting more information about how the Bible was formed. How do we know it's correct and authentic? So it's really funny though, ladies, because I downloaded the audible version of this. So I've not actually seen the physical book in my hand and I get all excited and I push play on my, on my phone as I'm driving, you know, to go get the kids from school. And I did this like, not like a double take, but like a triple take. Like I just, cause you know how it shows you how long a book is? I just kept like looking at it. What? What? I was like looking deeper. It's 40 hours long. <laughs> 40 hours long. But it's really, really good. And I realized it's like if I were to listen to one podcast a day for 40 days straight, you know, like I, it's the same thing. And so um, it's very in-depth. If any of you ladies are at a point anytime, whether it's now or in the future, that you really are hungry for a lot of these questions, it's really, it's really well done. Um, so evidence that demands a verdict. But anyway, one point that they make, which I thought was really interesting, is that prophets from God were recognized immediately, like immediately recognized as speaking the words of God. So it wasn't like hundreds of years later, oh, that was a prophet in our midst. No, it was recognized immediately as speaking the word of God. So this is true in the Old Testament for prophets like Isaiah or Ezekiel or Jeremiah. Um, they were immediately recognized as speaking the word of God. Some chose not to listen. 
But there was an immediate recognition that God was speaking to his people and he was speaking through these people, through these prophets. So when prophets spoke from God, then their words were added to what we call the canon of scriptures. The canon, that means the collection of what we believe is the word of God. So the Old Testament actually was, is an accumulation of God speaking his covenant to his people over a thousand years. So, a th- so Moses wrote the Pentateuch, we believe, in about 1400 BC, and Malachi prophesied in about 400 BC. So we've got a thousand years of the Hebrew scriptures being written and accumulated because as new prophets would speak, their words would be added to what was considered the canon of scripture. Does that make sense? So it was a continual process. Now it was ended. The Jewish scriptures or what we consider the Old Testament is considered closed at 400 um, BC, but it was accumulation through that time. So Jeremiah speaks of a new prophet to come um, uh, and a Messiah and a new covenant. So Jeremiah says there's going to be a new prophet, which we know is John the Baptist. There's going to be a Messiah and there's going to be a new covenant. So in the Jewish mind, if a new prophet would speak, it would be assumed that their words would be added to the canon of scripture. So when John came on the scene as a prophet and when Jesus re- came and was recognized as the Messiah, their words would need to be written down and added to the canon because they were considered new additional prophecy. Uh, and that became the gospels. So it's the writing down of the words of the, John the Baptist and Jesus as the new prophetic word of God, as God now again speaking to his people. So the apostles were also recognized as prophets in the sense that they were also speaking the word of God and interpreting it. So there's a lot of evidence that Paul's letters were immediately considered the word of God because they were in this context of when a prophet speaks, we write it down and we remember it and we add it to our scriptures. And in the Jewish mindset, there was this, again, this belief that new prophecy would still be added. They were waiting for God to speak to them again. They were waiting for the next prophet, waiting for their Messiah. So describing, um, so that uh, consider that words of God would come describing the new covenant that Jeremiah had prophesied would come. So this expectation that there would be new scripture, new prophecy, new words of God coming with the new covenant. So um, Paul's letters were immediately recognized as necessary additions to the canon of scripture. So I, I think that's interesting to realize that it wasn't just this great teacher who was circulating letters at this point. There was a sense that God was speaking again and it needed to be recorded and needed to be remembered. So Epaphrasus is recognizing that there's problems in the church in Colossae and he goes to Paul for an authoritative word from God on the errors in this church. Uh, Paul's friend Tychicus is already, has already um, slated to bring the letter we call Ephesians to the area of Asia. So Paul sends this letter to the church in Colossae, also in Asia, with Tychicus to deliver it. He also sends a letter to Philemon, who hosts the church in Colossae in his home there, um, which is in the letter is asking uh, Philemon to welcome back and forgive this runaway slave Onesimus. Um, who has become a Jesus follower through his relationship with Paul in Rome. So uh, Tychicus and Onesimus will head to Asia with letters for the churches around Ephesus and the letter to Colossae and the letter to Philemon who lives in Colossae, Um, which is all great context. And I love great context, but we still haven't answered the question, what problems is Paul addressing in the church in Colossae. Uh, and we have to remember, again, as I mentioned, that it's like we're listening to one side of a phone conversation. Um, but it does ha- when we read this letter, it does help to know a little bit about Colossae. I mentioned last week that unlike any of the other churches that Paul writes letters to, Colossae is an insignificant little city. Uh, it was known for wool production and having a lot of sheep. It was on a major road, so that got brought people to it. It was on a major road from Ephesus to the central highlands of the peninsula. There are no major gods or temples in Ephes- like there were in Ephesus or Corinth. Um, but I did mention the area was known for sort of this mystical 
um, religious ecstatic style of worship. Um, the Gentile, it was Gentile population, but there was an elite, wealthy Jewish group as well. Um, Jewish thought at this time, as I also mentioned last week, had become very influenced by mystical Greek beliefs. So they believed in this intrinsic evil of all matter, of everything that is living, um, would, and this absolute separation between God and the created world. So in this Judaism, um, angels powers were these sort of necessary intermediaries between God and his creatures. Certain ceremonial and ritualistic actions under angelic direction allowed people to kind of raise themselves up above the material world and regain an understanding of God. So um, this would become what no, is known as Gnosticism. This is at this point is a very early Gnosticism gets developed in its fuller state later on. Um, but it's a sense that all material world is bad and all spiritual is good. Material bad, spiritual good. And I asked you ladies last week and you got this right away. So I asked you, so if the material world is bad, if the body is bad, then what might the Gnostics deny about Jesus? What would they deny? That he, that he, right, that he was God, that he actually... Right, exactly. They would say he was not human. He was like a God walking in the midst of us. So um, they would deny that he was actually human, that he was actually part of the material bodily world. And it seems that Colossae, that these false beliefs about Christ had circulated because we see that they're likely, we see a sense that they're either denying his humanity or they're denying his deity. And we read last week how there's this great um just whole complete understanding of who Christ is. And one of the big things it says is that he, he was for the fullness of God in bodily form. So we see that it's combating the sense of that time that Jesus, they were saying that Jesus could not have been, and he could not, God would not put himself down to be part of our material world. Um, so as we read last week, you know, pa Paul begins, uh, Colossians by very clearly stating who Christ is. Um, last week, I told you ladies, or we talked a while at the end, the phrase that really gave me pause was how it says that um, Jesus was the firstborn from among the dead. Um, Jennifer, I love that you were reading a book and looking that up. Did any of you ladies um, look into that any further uh, this week? It's okay if you say no, but I was curious if any of you like decided to dive into that a little bit more. Uh, well, I wanted to do some more research because I always get mad if I don't fully understand something and I want to like get it. So, um, I'm reading, so one of the commentators I'm reading right now is this guy named Melek. He writes on Colossians. I really like him. I like his perspective. So he describes how the description of Jesus in that section was most likely an early hymn. And mom, you'd even mentioned this last week, the way it's very rhythmic and sounding. So, um, and that it could have, so it could have been broken into stanzas really easily. And actually that's a handout. One of the handouts I've given you ladies is you have on one side, you have a full um, outline of Colossians. And on the other side, you'll see that um, these verses are broken into stanzas. And for those of you ladies on Zoom or listening to this, I did email this out. But if you didn't get it, you want to email me, I'll send it to you. So um, we don't know if the hymn was original to Paul or if it was written by someone else, but he puts his stamp of approval on it by including it here in Colossians. The first stanza refers to Jesus and creation. Can you see that? If you see how it's really is broken up in these two, three stanzas actually. Uh, the third stanza refers to Jesus and redemption. So the first is Jesus and creation, and there's like an interlude, then Jesus and redemption. The point is that Jesus is Lord over all creation, and he's Lord over the new creation. He is the firstborn over all creation, and he's the firstborn over the new creation. Because do you see how they're parallel? Whenever we see that kind of literary parallelism, then we want to look for what's being, what's the point? Why is there a literary parallelism going on? Uh, last week, I mentioned that scholars talk about the firstborn in relation to two things, in relation to time and in relation to supremacy. So some scholars believe that Jesus was literally firstborn in time, firstborn from the dead. But that, I questioned that. That's the part that I was like, uh, that doesn't seem to me to be correct according to how I understand the full canon of scripture. So looking at these two phrases as connected, I think helps us understand them even more. So um, it highlights 
also the problem in understanding firstborn as based on time. Because if firstborn literally refers to the very first in time, then what's the problem with calling Jesus the firstborn over creation? What's the problem with that? If Jesus, if it's saying that this is li- if firstborn, because it's the same word used two times, firstborn over creation, firstborn from the dead. So what's the problem with calling Jesus a firstborn over creation if it literally refers to time, like the very first? Too long? Well, thinking back to creation, so thinking of it just based on creation, what's the problem with calling Jesus the firstborn of creation? He was always around. Exactly. So based on the Trinity, we believe Jesus always was. The, the Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit, always was. It's not that there's a separation and part of the Godhead was later created. Does that make sense? He didn't have to be born. Exactly. There's no sense of Jesus being born at the beginning of time. Jesus was born to Mary. He, Jesus left the father for a portion, but, and returned to the father. But it's very clear that, um, like, so John 1, 1 through 3 and 14, you ladies remember these beautiful words. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word, a word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. So he was God, was was with God and was God in the beginning. All things were made through him. So what do we learn about Jesus' relationship to God through this? We learned that he was with God in the beginning and that through him, all things, all things were made. So if Jesus is the firstborn over creation, that doesn't mean, that can't mean literal order, right? It can't mean a literal firstborn. So then it would follow that calling him the firstborn from among the dead doesn't have to do with time either because the two phrases are parallel. Does that make sense? And the word would be used the same way. Paul is using the word the same way in both sentences. Am I losing you ladies or does that make sense? Kind of? Okay. So I remember that from last week, the Greek word that was used for firstborn is this word protokos, which can literally refer to birth, birth order. It can refer to firstborn as in the verse, firstborn of a family. But in the Old Testament, it referred to inheritance and it referred to authority taking the father's place as head of the family, of being sovereign um, over or head of a household. So it also became tied to David and his line. He was called the firstborn, so it became a messianic title as well. So if we understand protocols as preeminence, as authority over, does that make, does that understanding make sense here? So how is Jesus preeminent over creation, authority over creation? And you can, ladies can answer that. How is Jesus the authority over creation? Part of the Trinity, exactly. So he is preeminent authority over creation, the firstborn of of the creation in the sense of the firstborn son, the firstborn inheritance and authority of governing over that would make sense. Um, and actually Colossians answers that because in Colossians 1, 16, so in following this statement, so it says, um, 15 says, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, or the thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. So if all things are created through him and for him, he's not the literal firstborn. He's the authority over. And then, so all things have been created through Jesus and for Jesus, like the firstborn son who's authority over his father's household. Jesus has full authority over creation. So if preeminent is the best translation, then how is Jesus preeminent over death? Any thoughts on that? He can beat it. Yeah, totally. Yes. The death does not have authority over him, right? 
that Jesus has authority over death. He's preeminent over death. Even death does not have authority over him. Colossians 1, 18 through 20 actually does unpack, unpack this better. It says, um, okay, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So verse 18, Christ is firstborn from the dead so that in everything he might have what? What's the word? Supremacy. Exactly. So Christ has authority over death. Death does not win. For us who believe, we know that death, we know that death does not win. And we look forward to eternity with Christ. And what is the point of Christ having preeminence over death? Well, verse 20, it says, Through Christ, God reconciles to himself all things by making peace through his blood. So Christ's preeminence over death, his conquering of death, reconciles us to God. And the point is that reconciliation. Commentator Melek had great perspective. He said, Just as creation depends on him, on Jesus, for its existence and order, redemption depends on him, Jesus, and he is the primary figure in it. So just as creation depends on Jesus for order and for its existence, redemption depends on Jesus for its existence. So thinking of Christ as preeminent over creation and death falls in line with what other parts of scripture says. Because that's the, what I was having trouble with last week is if it's thinking of him as a firstborn. And I was telling you ladies how some will say that, believe that Jesus, that we all 100% die and then are all just soul sleep or something raised back when Christ returns. That's what this question is. Because if Christ is the firstborn from the dead, if he's a literal firstborn and no one has been raised to be with God until his return, that doesn't make sense to me according to how I understand scripture. We talked about it last week, you know, that Jesus in his transfiguration, he meets with Elijah and Moses on the mountain, right? So we have the sense that they were already existing in some form, even though they had died. And remember Jesus's comment to the thief on the cross where he says, today you will be with me in paradise, right? Today. So, um, so scripture gives a sense that we are with God as soon as we die. Yet we look forward to a new heaven and a new earth and Christ's return and somehow in some form a fuller resurrected body, that there is some kind of transformation that happens at that point. We don't understand what it means, but we get the sense that we are with Christ immediately upon death. And I think even from experience, I mean, we don't necessarily like to argue from experience. We want to argue from what the scripture says, but there have been so many near death encounters, right? Where people talk about this light and this sense of like glory and amazement and like, I'm there but then suddenly I'm not. And that that has been a story that's been experienced by so many people that I know, again, we're arguing from experience, but we can't also entirely discount experience either. Um, okay, any questions or wisdom to share, ladies, on this part here? <laughs> Jennifer. Oh, good. Absent from the body and present with the Lord. That's good. Yay. Perfect. No, that's good. I love it. That's like, that's exactly what I want you to be doing is thinking of what else do we understand that the scripture says? Because when we read something that maybe seems a little bit different, it doesn't mean that we throw it out. It means that we get curious and try and dive deeper to understand it. So like that's how we get curious about this Greek word protokos. What does that really mean? Does it literally mean firstborn or is it talking about the preeminence and authority of the firstborn son? So that's perfect. So yes, because we want to weigh everything according to the whole canon of scripture and not just pulling one verse out and saying this is what it means. So good job. Okay, let's keep going with Colossians. All right, so from here, Paul is going to specifically combat what is called the Colossian heresy. And that heresy, and that's just what scholars call it, the Colossian heresy. Heresy. Um, but before he does, he's going to give his credentials. So if you ladies look at the outline that I gave you as well, it kind of shows you where we're going today. He's going to remind the Colossians 
why he has authority to be a messenger from God to them. So he's going to deal with the false things going on in their um, church. But before he's going to deal with it, he's going to remind them, why does he have the right to speak into their lives? Why does he have the right to be the authority? So um, we remember that Colossians, that the Colossians had not met Paul personally. Um, So why does Paul have the right to speak authoritatively to them? So I'm going to start with uh, Colossians 1, reading verses 24 through 29. All right, 124. Now, I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission of God, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Okay, so Paul starts by saying that he rejoices that he's suffering for the Colossians. Now, how do we know that he is literally currently suffering for the Colossians? Where is he? He's in prison. Exactly. So he means this literally. I'm actually suffering for you right now. Um, So, but the next phrase causes us to go, what? (laughs) What does that mean? I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. That's one of those phrases where you're like, what? What is he talking about? Um, So, because we know that Paul, that Jesus's work was complete. So in what ways is Paul filling what was lacking in Christ's afflictions? So Melek, again, my new best friend commentator Melek, notices The same Greek word is used in verses 24 and 25. Paul says, I fill up. um, I'm not, I'm not going to say the Greek word. I'm just going to butcher it. But anyway, I fill up in my flesh, what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. And then in verse 25, it is to present to you the word of God in its fullness. So I fill up in fullness are the same Greek word. I fill up. In my flesh, what is lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions to present to you the word of God in its fullness. So Melek says, this lexical pattern, so using the same word twice, provides insight to recognize that Paul has conceived of his mission in two dimensions, suffering and completion of the word of God. So So Paul recognizes his mission is to suffer and to complete the word of God. So the verb to fill up actually only occurs here in scripture. It's the only time that this word is used and it's used these two times. The preposition again, Anna, is prefixed to the root word and another Greek preposition in place of anti is added to it. And all that means is that when you add these two prepositions to this word, the word conveys the idea of completing in place of. So, uh, when I fill up in my body, the sense is in completing in place of or completing for someone else, completing on behalf of someone else. So Paul is not saying that Christ's sufferings were not enough. That's not what he's saying here. That somehow Christ's work on the cross was not enough for atonement. He's not saying that. So Paul seems to be saying that he is continuing the work of Christ on earth, that his sufferings are part of continuing that work of Christ on earth. That Paul suffers for the sake of who? Verse 24, who is he suffering for? Suffering for, in verse 24, the body or the church. So his commission by God is to present the word of God, verse 25, in what? In in fullness, exactly. So And what is this full message that Paul is proclaiming? Verse 26, it's a mystery that has been hidden from previous generations, 
but is now disclosed. And what is that mystery? Do you ladies remember that from Ephesians? He just talked about it. So the, or we just read about it in our last book. So the mystery is that God has chosen to include who in his plan for salvation? Gentiles, exactly. Paul unpacked this fuller in Ephesians 3. I'll just read it briefly. So you can stay where you are, but I'm going to go back to Ephesians 3 and read 1 through 6. And remember that he writes Ephesians at the exact same time as he writes Colossians. So he's just, it's the same thought, but he's unpacked it a little bit more in Ephesians 3. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you'll be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. So Paul's job was to explain that the Gentiles were included in God's covenant. That was his job. So with Christ having returned to the Father already, Paul completes Christ's work on earth by proclaiming to the Gentiles that they are part of God's family, his covenant community, when they accept Christ's atoning work on the cross for them. So Paul's commission is to complete or carry out the work of Christ through suffering and through proclaiming his word in its fullness or explaining the full scope of Christ's redemptive work. That includes all people, not just Jews, that all people can be part of the covenant of God. So, and what is Paul's end goal in verse 28? He says to present everyone fully mature in Christ. And how does he do this? Verse 29, I love this. He says, with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me, I love that. I kind of want to pause even on that phrase for just a sec. So whose energy is Paul relying on? In the, whose energy does he say he's relying on? He's re- relying on Christ's energy. Exactly. I thought about that this morning when I woke up at 6.15 to read my Bible. And my I have a monthly share group that are just the most amazing, amazing Christian women who love the Lord. And we meet together once a month and we meet late because we all have kids. And we had met till 10.30 last night and I had hosted us. So then I had cleaned up until 11.30 and then I got myself to bed by midnight. And then my alarm went off at 6.15 so that I could go study the word of God before my kids would get up. And I had that moment of, oh Lord, <laughs> I need your energy, but let's, and so I think that this phrase applies directly to our lives. Like uh, when we are walking in Christ's calling for our lives, he will give us all the energy we need. I believe that this is a calling for us to be intentional and to be focused, intentional and focused to separate what is God's calling for us right now And what do I maybe add to my plate that is not God's calling? To separate the calling from what we add in. Paul clearly says that we will have all the energy we need to fulfill the work that God has for us. So we need to look closely at our lives and ask, what is God calling me to right now in this season of my life? What might I be adding that is not his calling Especially if any of you ladies are feeling in any way overwhelmed or exhausted in any, for any reason, likely that means it's probably time to simplify in some way and ask the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom on what is God's calling for you right now in this current season of your life. Um, and so what are my callings right now? And I was thinking about this yesterday as I was writing this. My, my callings are to love and respect my husband, to love my children and bring them up in the Lord to teach the word of God and create opportunities for women at this church to connect with God and to connect with each other, to love and encourage the friends that are huge blessings in my life, to witness of God's power and truth, the people that God places in my life. So what is your calling ladies in your current season right now? Are there things you need to simplify from your life to focus on that calling? 
And I'll have you ladies ponder these questions at the end so you can hold that. Um, before we leave this section, uh, let's notice one more thing about verse 25. Um, we see Paul's goal among the Colossians and the authority by which he does it. Do you see that? Paul says that he has become the servant of the church by whose commission? By God's commission, exactly. With the goal to present the word of God to the Colossians in what? In fullness, exactly. So Paul's commissioned by God, his authority to speak to the Colossians comes from God. He is operating in this prophetic role of speaking the words of God so that they would fully understand God's word to them, his plan and his purpose for them. So Paul has given the basis for his authority. He's given his goal for the Colossians. Um, and why does Paul need to assert his authority among them? Well, because he's concerned about them and he's concerned about what they're believing right now. So I'm going to read Colossians 2, 1 through 7. I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea, which is the near, nearest big city. And for all who have not met me personally, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, and that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I'm absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. I love that Paul says his goal for the church in Colossae, verse 2, his goal is that they would be encouraged in what? Encouraged in heart. I love that. And that they would be united in love. I love that. So, so that, so encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they would have the full riches of what? Do you see? Complete understanding. Exactly. Paul wants them to be encouraged in heart, united in love, and have the full understanding of God's truth of his word. And I pray that same for us, ladies, that we would be encouraged in heart, united in love, and have the full understanding of Christ in whom is all wisdom and understanding. And what, um, and why does Paul want this? Well, it, he's worried about them. He's worried that they are being deceived, verse 4, by fine-sounding arguments. Inversely, Paul wants them to instead, verse 7, be rooted and built up in Christ. And he's going to continue on in this thought. So now Paul is going to mention four fine sounding arguments that are leading them astray. And this is kind of the core of what they call the Colossian heresy. So first he's going to warn them against being led astray by other philosophies. So there's four things he's going to warn them against other philosophies. And let's start there. So I'm just going to read verses eight through 10, Colossians two. So see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. So pausing there. Um, so what does, how does Paul describe the philosophies of the culture around them? Verse eight, philosophies of the culture around them are what? They are hollow and deceptive. I love that. And where do those philosophies come from? Verse eight, this is interesting. They come from human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of the world. So ladies, notice this. Any belief or philosophy that does not proclaim Christ is based on human tradition or the work of the enemy. It's really clear. So any philosophy that does not proclaim Christ is based on either human tradition or the work of the enemy. Any philosophy that puts anything else on the throne in your life, on the throne other than Christ, is based only on tradition or the work of the enemy. 
I have been encouraging you ladies um, to consider reading Mama Bear Apologetics, which is this book I've been reading with our moms group on Friday mornings. Um, and they go through the philosophies of our modern culture and how and show who or what is on the throne in those philosophies. For example, they talk about self-helpism. Who is on the throne in self-helpism? You can guess by just that first word, yourself. Exactly. It's the belief that I, that I have all the power I need inside of me to heal myself. I just need to have someone tell me how to do it. So, or, so self-hism, self-helpism. I am on the throne. I have the power to heal myself, to make my life better. Uh, naturalism, what's on the throne in naturalism? Any of you ladies know what naturalism is? Naturalism is, is, um, is essentially says that everything can be explained scientifically by natural laws and chance. They add in chance. And so naturalism, everything can be explained by chance and natural laws. So, um, and so that's putting science on the throne, saying that science can explain everything. Absolutely everything going on in our world, science can explain it. Um, which is actually not true, but um, it can explain many things. Um, So for the Colossians, it seems it was early Gnosticism was the philosophy that was leading them astray, um, that all material things are bad and evil because in in Christ, verse 9, it says, who dwells? The fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. So he's saying, don't let people take you captive with other philosophies or beliefs. Don't let people tell you that Christ was not 100% God and 100% human at the same time. Um, And though this may be something that's honestly a little bit hard for our brains to fully wrap around the understanding that Christ was fully human and fully God at the same time, um, we, we, we believe that and it, with an element of faith, even if we fully do not understand that. But that is what God's word tells us, that Christ was human and he was God, 100% each. So um, next, so don't let anyone take you captive with false philosophies. It says next, Paul warns them against being led astray by, any, by ceremonial Jewish laws. So the context of these next verses, Colossians 2, 11 through 17, that I'm going to read, are in the context of ceremonial Jewish traditions. So he's saying, don't let these um, take you captive either. So chapter two, starting in verse 11. In him, meaning in Jesus, in him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or you drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that are to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Let's look at those, that, those phrases for a few minutes. Okay, so in, uh, so in the first covenant, what did every male have to do should be considered part of the covenant community? He had to be circumcised. Exactly. So every male child, eight days old, had to be circumcised. Every male convert to Judaism also had to be circumcised. So this was a circumcision done by a priest or a rabbi. So done by human hands. So circumcision done by human hands would be literal um, circumcision entrance into the Jewish community. So the problem was, did the old covenant bring life? No, the old covenant did not bring life. The function of the old covenant was to show us a faithful God and to show a humankind who could not adequately return that faithfulness on their own. We see a patient God in the old covenant and people who could never get it right. That's the story of the Israelites, people who could never get it right. The law or old covenant shows us our need for Christ because none of us are ever good enough to please God. We are ruled by our sinful nature 
by our identity as Adam's offspring. But now in Christ, our actions or physical circumcision do not bring us into the covenant community. So it's no longer circumcision or actions that bring us into the covenant community. But instead, in Christ, we go through a full transformation internally. We undergo what they call a spiritual circumcision. Our old self that was ruled by the flesh is put off and baptism symbolizes this. So our old nature, our old self is buried with Christ in baptism. It's like if you imagine the immersion style baptism is what we're thinking of versus the sprinkling. So you go down into baptism to fully immersed and that symbolizes death, right? And then you come up and that symbolizes your new life in Christ. So our old, say, our old nature, our old self is buried with Christ like we were immersed in water and our new self is raised back to life through faith in Jesus for we were dead in our sins and transgressions. So, but now verse 13, we are made, what are we in Christ? We are made alive in Christ and through Christ's work on the cross, all the charges against us are canceled. All the charges against us have been what? Verse 14. I love this. All the charges against us have been, when, do you see that in verse 14? They have been nailed to the cross. Don't you love that? All the charges against us have been nailed to the cross. They have been canceled. All the charges against us are left back on the cross with Jesus. They are back there. He has triumphed over all sin, over every power, over every authority, because we are forgiven because the charges against us are canceled, we do not need to ritually observe the Jewish law. So we no longer have to live by these rituals. We we are free in Christ. But as we've also read about in Romans and 1 Corinthians, our freedom should not cause another to stumble in their faith, right? That's a whole different discussion. But Right here, Paul is focusing on our freedom in Christ not to have to observe certain rituals because those were part of an old covenant that didn't work. And now under the new covenant in Jesus, it's not a physical circumcision, but a heart circumcision. Jeremiah said that I will give them new hearts. And that then with our new hearts, we are able to grasp how wide and deep and love and, and high is the love of God. So here... Um, Paul Paul says, don't let others judge you for whether you practice these Jewish traditions Um, and with what you eat and with what you drink. So that would be the dietary laws. You ladies know about the dietary laws. So don't let people judge you by what you eat or drink uh, or whether you participate in Jewish festivals or this is interesting in what day of the week you worship. Verse 16. Do you see that? Don't let people judge you over the Sabbath. So we get the sense that by this time, Christian worship had likely actually switched to Sundays instead of Saturdays because it's saying, don't let people judge you. If your Sabbath is Saturday, fine. I mean, I know I'm reading between the lines, but that's what he's saying. Don't let people judge you over the Sabbath. And in, what's in, implicit in that is whether you're celebrating it on Saturday or Sunday. So, um, and af- so then he kind of, he keeps going. And again, he's still focusing on don't, um, don't let these practices take you captive. So don't let the philosophies of culture like Gnosticism, don't let the practices of Jewish traditions, don't let those take you captive. Um, Then after this, he actually talks to the Colossians about worshiping angels. So this gives us a sense of kind of the mysticism that's going on at this point. So just verses 18 and 19, he says, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail, but what they've seen or they are puffed up with idle notions of their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. So angels were seen as closer to God, somehow communicating with him. But in Christ, we know we have direct access to God, that we communicate with him directly. We don't need any intermediaries. We pray directly to God and he delights in that intimacy with us. We see that's easy for believers to be misguided in their thoughts and practices, to be puffed up with their idle notions and to lose connection with the head, with Jesus. 
Um, and then finally, one more false thing he's going to combat. Paul warns the Colossians against unnecessary asceticism. And these are our final verses. So Colossians 20, or sorry, 2, 20, sorry, Colossians 2, 20 through 23. Since you died with Christ to the element of spiritual forces of the world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have, have, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Um, Malik says, commentary Malik says, the Colossians wanted to measure their Christian progress by the things of this earth. I thought that was a great uh, comment. The Colossians wanted to measure their Christian progress, how are they doing in their faith, by the things of the earth, by how religious they looked. So ladies, I think we can easily apply this and say, in what ways do we measure Christian progress according to how religious we look? So, and you can throw out some answers to me, like how, in what ways do we say, oh, you're a really good Christian if you don't do this, or if you do this, how do we measure according to how we look? You can throw out some things, whether we do what or don't do what, whether we have a devotional every day. Oh, you are so spiritual. You read your Bible every day. Good. Exactly. What else? Um, What about like the sin laws? Are you drinking, smoking? Dancing, (laughs) my favorite. Um, Yes, promoting our disciplines, showing off on Instagram how amazing we are. Like, absolutely. These types of regulations can have appearance of wisdom, right? Can have an appearance of wisdom. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't, you know, as some Christian um, subgroups will um, promote. Not, Not here as Presbyterians. We're allowed to drink and smoke in moderation. Not that I smoke. I don't smoke. I don't like smoking. But anyway, <laughs> uh, these types of regulations can have an appearance of wisdom, but what do they lack? Verse 23, verse 23 they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. We see a lot of kids coming out of very fundamentalist backgrounds that go crazy when they have freedom, right? That oftentimes um, they even walk away from Christ for good at that point in their life. Um, maybe they look like great kids growing up. They could have, but it was an outward rule structure that bound them and not their inner self, their inner heart. So we do not want to be bound by outward rules. We want to be bound by a circumcision of our hearts, our hearts that are transformed for Christ. So it's, um, it's a regular putting off of the old self and letting Christ transform us from glory to glory. So let's review what seemed to be the problems of this church in Colossae. So this early Gnosticism denying the deity of Christ, um, following philosophies of the culture around them. Uh, Three, following Jewish ceremonial traditions. Um, Four, angel worship. That seemed to be an issue. And five, following ascetic rules to look religious. So these were the things going on at this church, it looks like. And my question for us to ponder is, are there ways that we do any of these things ourselves? And so, ladies, I gave you um, questions. And how are we on time? Oh, good. It's perfect. 1030. Um, What I'd love for you ladies to do is to spend like just five minutes right now working through these questions, and then I will close this. But I'd also invite you to take them. That's why I wrote them down because they're kind of long this week. Invite you to take them with you and even spend some more time pondering them um, on your own and in your own devotions this week. But I'll read them to you. So, um, you know, first, always, ladies, if you have any questions, write them down because I'd love to discuss questions. Um, Two, um, what is God's calling on your life right now? We talked about that earlier in our class. In this season, are there things that are not part of your calling that you need to simplify out of your life right now? So ponder that. Because remember, as Paul says, we have all the energy we need for all the callings, for his calling in our life right now. Um, Are there ways, three, that you might unwittingly follow some of the heresies at Colossae? Is Christ your just sort of a great teacher of love, your neighbor, or is he Lord of your life? Is he on the throne of your life? Are there philosophies of our culture that you follow, that you might need to re-examine. 
Um, are there ceremony traditions, ceremonial traditions you follow that you might need to re-examine? Are there things that sometimes take the throne in your life that are not Christ? Are there things that are easy to sort of put your hope and your sense of worship in those things? Are there aesthetic rules that you follow that you might need to re-examine to experience freedom in Christ? So these are all things for you ladies to ponder. Um, you know, are any of the heresies in class a things that maybe sneak into our own lives in little ways as well?